So like a crooked path in a big garden, we've got a long distance to cover in a short time. And so I'd like to start with here. And I've got two diagrams that I want to cover with you. The first is based on the, on the title of the topic, uh, and we'll cover this in more detail, but this is a diagram that I created a few years ago, um, starting with the 3579 column hall and its status and variation. We'll go through that. And then we've got this matrix that we're going to fill in. It's got uh, 10 different items or, or types of things going on in the garden itself and the architecture and the pavilions based on our Portland lots of garden. So we'll fill that in and it's based on status and hierarchy and the, and the elements. So, but to get to start all of that, I want to, you know, all want to tie it all together and I'm a little bit more interested in just matrices and diagrams. So I created a, a, a story that takes places on four timelines. So I have a little debate one with my wife. Uh, how many of you are familiar with, uh, with the movie um, Inception? So Inception. So we got a few. Okay. My wife was right. Yeah. Okay. So Inception is a modern movie that takes place on multiple levels of consciousness at the same time. And it's and these these men have a, a mission to, to achieve on multiple mental levels, and they can share the mental levels as they go, and they go back and forth. So basically, this is sort of doing the same thing. I'm starting my main character, Hai Rui. I'm, I'm going to try to use HR because it's simpler to use. It's a, it's a very famous uh, scholar official from the from the Ming Dynasty. Um, and he was based in Suzhou in 1569 and 70. Uh, he was uh, very, very well uh, recognized as someone with total honesty and sincerity to the point that he was sentenced to death for criticizing the emperor. Uh, and we'll go into that a little bit more. Jumping to 1959, Wuhan versus Yao and Yun. 1959, uh, Wuhan wrote a story, a play, based on Hai Rui's life. Uh, criticize, uh, using a, as a metaphor, Yao Wenyun was a high-ranking official in Mao's government and uh, started writing articles in 1964-63 criticizing Wuhan's play, which became the Cultural Revolution. Wuhan and other playwrights had done other plays based on Hai Rui, and Wuhan and other playwrights were actually killed in, in, during the Cultural Revolution based because of Hai Rui's plays. Uh, or the topic, Hai Rui's tomb was actually uh, destroyed and, and his remains were incinerated during the Cultural Revolution. But if you go to Hainan Island now, uh, Haiku, uh, Haikau is the main uh, city in Hainan Island. Uh, there is now a new shrine that has been built for Hai Rui. I'm going to have Hai Rui walking through the Master of Fishnet's Garden. Uh, there's, a, there's a discrepancy in the timeline there because Master of the Fishnets actually, which for, for those of you who are not aware, Master of the Fishnets is probably the closest garden to our Portland Sudos, Lansu. In size, it's considered our, our closest time. Um, but Master of Fishnets is sort of unique in itself in that it was built in the song, uh, basically went uh, abandoned and then wasn't rebuilt until the Qing Dynasty, based on Ming. So it's, uh, Fishnet is sort of like post-Ming post -Ming architecture, like our post-modern architecture. Uh, and then our garden, Lan Su, that matrix that you see we're going to fill in is all based on, on Lan Su garden. So the story for Hai Rui starts with uh, Hai Rui as a government official in Suzhou starting in, in 1567, and we'll call this 19, uh, 1570. And this is the main, we're looking north to south. And Hai Rui gets an invitation to, to join what I'm going to call fictitious family Chen to the master of the fishnet garden, which is right back up here. So his journey through the city uh, starts along that path. And I call it Roofscapes of the City because whenever you look at an overall picture of a Chinese town, village, almost anything, 
you can read the hierarchy of that town village. If you watch a Chinese movie, you can like they usually show an overview of the, of the village, and just by the hierarchy of the, of the roofs, you can understand the hierarchy of the townscape. And it's based on very simple things where you have the low, lowest class uh, building here, and then you can see it becomes a little bit more and more and more, and it's very recognizable. And here's another diagram showing the same kind of thing. And there's very interesting subtleties there as you go up in hierarchy as well. But it's just as simple as that in terms of very visual clues recognize the roofscape of his memory. So Hyrule is walking along through Suzhou and little, you know, looking at the roofscapes and over bridges and has few memories of Beijing, his time at the Emperor. Um, his memories of his childhood in Hainan, this was a garden that was built just at the time that he was born, uh, memorizing or commemorating five scholars who were exiled from, by a previous emperor to Hainan Island. Uh, and so this is a temple in Hainan, you can see it's very tropical south of, it's basically across Hanlin Bay from uh, North Vietnam. Um, and you can see it's very tropical, but this is a temple of the five scholars uh, uh, commemorating their exile. So these are in his memory. Uh, but here, here we go. So here's Hainan. So you have Vietnam, Hainan Island, there's um, uh, Hong Kong, right, basically back up in here. There's Taiwan across there. Here's Hainan Island in, in detail. The, um, some of the local building you can see is built out of uh, 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 almost like a sea stone type of stonework here. You can see it's a basic um, gable building. And so these buildings from most throughout uh, most of the Chinese uh, agricultural areas is what I call the three columns or the three pearl and hall. And so the way you look at that is here's column one, two, and three. You have a primary uh, hall, and then you have the eaves, which typically on the, the farmhouse are filled in. And this Lu Bang Ying from 507 BC was um, one of the very first that's been recorded that I found as uh, how to find how you build uh, within uh, Chinese culture. And I like these red things here. Whoever builds a house with three purlins on band's room must look for favorable measurements. If width and height are determined according to this method, in the future many good sons will be brought forth. <laughs> so uh, it pulls in everything, right? The, the how you build, the, the virtues that will occur if you build well. When you get into the city, uh, in Confucianism, and I'm jumping around here a little bit, um, the highest rank in Confucian society is the scholar officials and the emperor, obviously. And then you have the farmers and craftsmen, people that make things. The lowest level of, in Confucian society are the merchants who don't really produce anything in society. They just buy and sell and make profit and make, you know, make life easier. And so, you know, when you're in the city, typically the merchant, it's based on, obviously, uh, both size and so forth, but you have a five pound pump. And so you can see the five purlins. One, you know what purlins are? Okay, so purlins are the long beams. You have the columns that are holding things up, and the purlins run along the top of the columns. Okay, and so um, when you talk, when you talk about five column hall or five purlin hall, these red lines would be the purlins. So there's five. One, two, three, four, five. And so, again, yet using this blue bomb from 507, here's the five column hall. One, two, three, four, five. So the purlins are these beams right there. With five purlins in three bays, this is, again, from 507 BC, right? Um, if the timbers are measured according, life in it will be peaceful with abundance of luck, and sudden wealth will enter the house time and again. Right? So a merchant's hall is perfect for five purlin hall. So here we go, Eves, Henry Hall, and this st starts showing my, my color coding here. So you have the primary hall and a secondary interior hall that, that can be combined in various ways. And then a lot of times this Eve is either outside, inside. So when I'm talking about Confucianism, I know I'm talking to an audience that knows their stuff here. 
But there's all, there's, you know, hundreds of these diagrams out here. Confucianism uh, started, he was born uh, Confucius in 551 BC. Now, Lao Tzu was born in 601. Very almost overlap. And they've always been overlapped and intertwined. And it's this wonderful yin yang between Taoism, which for those of, you know, those of us who um, really uh, love the symbolism in the garden in Lao Tzu and in seeing my other talks, I, you know, I prefer the looseness and the one with all type stuff, the touchy feely of Taoism. And but this Confucianism is important to, to work with, understand, and it's this, um, basically the status of society and the structure. Um, human hierarchies have, have run the course, whether it's bullies on the playground, gorillas, and uh, you know, and their society. One of my favorite diagrams. I lived in Vienna actually for almost a year is the Aust uh, Vienna. And Australia, uh, Austrian society was totally stratified, had very low, low degree of social mobility, and as a result, social distinctions were very clear, let alone the diamond. Here's where the king lives, right there in the palace, uh, the wealthiest here, protected by this huge moat and, and fortification system, which uh, beat, beat back the Ottomans. And then you have the, the middle class out here, and then the farmland out here. Couldn't be more clear in the diagramming of the hierarchy of uh, Viennese society. And so um, HIR is moving through the city and he gets to um, master the fishnets. So this is a little bit more detail on master the fishnets. You can see it's similar in size to our Lan Su. This is one of the most famous uh, views of uh, master the fishnets. And we'll talk about this in that pavilion right there. And as I said, it's, it's post made the architecture in that uh, it was abandoned and then rebuilt in 1765. The Ming Dynasty starts in 1644, right? So, uh, I mean, I mean, the Ming to Qing is 1644. So it's pretty late, almost 100, over 100 years after the, the Ming Dynasty. Yet it's built. The gardens were built in Ming Dynasty style, and so one of the one of the things that gives that away is. Here you're walking along the canal, and you get to this outside plaza and a very ornate uh, front door. And you can see this very linear assemblage of this hall. Uh, that is very uh, chain, very European, central axis. And one of the things that's, but Feng Shui-wise, very interesting is that this family was wealthy enough to be able to purchase this piece. And so by Feng Shui energy, flying through that, this central space, they had a reception hall with this as wall, right? And so this flying energy out that main axis got captured in here. Here's the, the street running this way. So I, I we, uh, was invited in our story, my story, to visit uh, a Yaji, uh, a, a gathering of scholars in this garden. So, um, so he comes, he gets to this doorway and he starts thinking of zigzag paths. So, completing this for Peace Garden, uh, here's our garden, Lan Su. Uh, the concept of our garden, Lan Su, the Yuan Portland Chizo Garden. Uh, David Wu, the congressman from Beaverton, and Mike Lindbergh, uh, commissioner, um, in 1985 started the sister city relationship. Uh, um, the actual beginnings of the contracts to start designing Lanzu was 1991. Uh, I joined the Classical Chinese Garden Society in 1990. So I've been with the garden for almost three years in some way or another. And, uh, and for, for those of you who know, uh, this garden, our garden, is not without Chinese uh, tragedy and uh, politics that the, the, the founders and the, and the major energy of the people that started this garden, uh, Classical Chinese Garden Society, were overthrown uh, just before the garden opened. And, uh, and we've benefited from a very uh, well-run garden for the last 20 years, but uh, there, w there was definitely, uh, in, in keeping with Chinese culture, a major overthrow just as the garden was about to be open. So our garden, Lansu, um, is just the garden portion of these large, very wealthy scholar pavilions or scholars' gardens from the Ming Dynasty. 
And these two diagrams, you can see the typical entrance compared to what I just showed you of master fishnets. The typical entries into a main garden, very understated no matter what the wealth is, uh, a very, usually very circuitous just as you enter and then turn. Because one, these are on narrow streets and evil spirits can only travel in straight lines, right? So if you have a very understated doorway, there's nothing for the evil spirit to catch into when you get to that door. Then if you turn multiple times in a little catch, see how this catches that movement there? That would catch any evil spirit that might happen to bounce in the door. Right? And so uh, our garden, Lansu, had a, a bunch of things, that, and I'll talk about that in a second, to overcome this because we didn't build the, the intensity of the courtyards. Um, so like all things, uh, Moving through Chinese architecture, there's one book that was written by a, a Chinese architect uh, from the uh, south, in the, the, the south Yangtze uh, area of China where Suzhou is, is the canal cities. And there's only a few of the canal cities left, and this architect was writing from there, and he talks about Chinese architecture as all about um, movement, both static and um, and um, in motion type movement. And so this is our, you know, the very famous uh, uh, crooked bridge of Lansu Garden. And one of my favorite examples, which I did cover pretty extensively in, in my previous lectures in 2008 and 11, is um, those of you who are um, familiar with the painted boat of Misty Rain, there's two panels of ginkgo, three panels of ginkgo, and one panel of ginkgo that um, all equal the same amount of width, just divided in different ways, and it bounces the people. When you're in uh, painted ball in misty rain, you're, you bounce through here like water over rocks or pinball machine, and that creates the crooked path. So this starts our matrix. And so we have zigzag paths, starting with the ticket booth, um, zigzag path into the ticket booth. Um, traditionally, it was supposed to be over that gateway in but it's a fairly simple street up to the, um, both the gift shop and the ticket booth, again, the lowest status, right? Into the Zhuang, into the, um, in the Zhuang room, one movement, and then again, uh, half window circled in green. You're starting on the ubiquitous path uh, going along here. You can see the beginning of a crooked path, and then you're in. Uh, knowing the fish. We have this wonderful window that's underutilized right now, but there used to be a really nice display, uh, almost a shrine type opening here that stops this hall, and then you turn into knowing the fish. Uh, so, um, so painted boat. Uh, so, so that's, that's not spring. Spring. yeah, that's uh, spring rain. Okay. Yeah. Um, Crooked path into Moonlocking Pavilion. Uh, multiple pathways in front of the tea house, our cosmic reflections. And then the two highest status halls in Lansu is, is the Celestial Hall, the Scholar Study, through this uh, gate here. And you can see that, look at the axis here. You're stopped by those stones. You have to turn. And then you get in here, and we'll get into that a little bit more. And my, my most famous of these zigzag path entrances. Again, uh, we had to simplify everything in Lansu because of access, you're open to the public, um, everything had to be ADA, but then you come in here and from the entranceway, here's the ticket uh, gatherer, and you hit these stones. And that's like one of the most important stones in the whole garden, and that it's, it's not lining up with that window. The energy as you're coming in the door it's this wonderful view of the Osmanthus and then this type of rock. And then you are diverted to the left to get to the known the, um, hollow rotated clouds. So, then you get to entry, entry thresholds. You have a farmhouse and, and, and um, the Forbidden City. You can see that how it gets expanded and all extra levels and more and more thresholds. And so in Master, Master of the Fishnets, here's the entry, and you come in here, and HR is in, entering this courtyard right here, called the Sedan Chair Courtyard, where, you know, obviously the high-ranking visitors on this, in a sedan chair were dropped off in this hall right here. 
the typical uh, scholars, you can see a scholar's pavilion with an uh, actual threshold here that you step up into. Our thresholds in Lansu were remo are removable because of the ADA. Uh, one of my pre-9-11 jokes was that evil spirits and Americans can't step over uh, thresholds. <laughs> and, um, and so um, I dropped that in 9-11. It didn't go so good after that. Um, but this is our removable threshold, and you can see uh, all of our doorways in Lansu are key for the removable thresholds. Um, and so they were built with that understanding that this level of hall would have that size of a, of a threshold. Again, you were supposed to be entering the whole garden uh, through this gateway, but again, Americans had a lot of trouble with that step right there, and so we, these benches were put in about a year and a half, two years later. So. Uh, the pavilion status, again, just a classic little EDE ramp into the merchant hall, right? The merchant hall gift shop, that's the lowest status. Uh, and then we start going up in status. Smooth entry, no separate threshold for the Juan room. Um, half window circling in green, there's a little bit of a ramp that steps up in there. Uh, knowing the fish, you have a sort of a formalized entry and you're going through the two lines that help protect that entrance. Uh, painted boat, you actually start getting a step to get up into it. Um, this, this is my symbol for basically not applicable and it's not worth going into at this point. So you'll see a couple of those, not a lot. Uh, here's top, uh, the tea house, uh, the tower. You can see an actual major step onto this threshold and then the actual threshold is actually built there because we're not using that as an entrance. Um, the scholar study ADA ramp to get past, they, they didn't want to leave this off, off architecturally, so they have a, just a little ramp here, another step, then the threshold. You can see how the thresholds are expanding in status. And then hollow rotated clouds, you see a whole major staircase in itself, an entry porch, and then you're into the threshold. So you can see, even each of these elements will pick up in scale and detail um, as you go. So HR, HR gets a little glimpse in that garden to the left, and you start seeing some scholar officials in, in this first pavilion. Um, and HR is a little bit intimidated by this whole invitation because uh, he didn't pass his scholar's exam. Uh, he worked on Hainan Island until he was 39 years old, basically as a school teacher and administrator, and then based on his reputation, uh, was then hired into Beijing, even without his being and passing the scholar's exam. But he knew he was coming into this very prestigious gathering in, in the garden. And so, uh, this whole idea of meeting these scholars and stepping into the clouds is a whole over, over concept of the whole scholar's exam system, uh, which set up the whole society of servicing the government from uh, local all the way up to um, the emperor. And the inscription in the scholar study in Lansu step, is stepping into the clouds, and that's the short form of the ascendancy as a, basically a compliment, like when you pass your exams, you're stepping into the clouds. The process of getting through the scholar's exam is called ladder to the clouds. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, it, it fits in our world as well. This is Chinese students taking an exam in today's world. Uh, and these were the testing courtyards of, uh, I think this is the Beijing one, and I have also one from Shanghai. These are the rows of these testing booths. And so this is the, an old plan of the Beijing um, uh, uh, Scholars Exam Center. These gates were locked. It was a three-day all-nighter. And I, I find it fascinating that even SAT uh, uses this form in, in, in the brutal fill-in-the-blanks that we all have in New York. Right? And, and it's like just uncanny, the similarity of these two things, right? But I, I did a little count. Each one of these is a student's little cubicle for his three-day all-nighter, right? So I did a little count. There's 1,288 there, and there's basically somewhere about 3,700 uh, slots for scholars' exams in that testing center. So 3,700 men were locked into this courtyard for a three-day all-nighter to write their uh, scholars' exams. And each level of the exams 
So you only got the top, the top 1% to move up through eight levels. So imagine, for those of you that got 98 percentile on your SAT, you would not have passed a single level of your scholars exam. Right? So when we're talking about these scholars, these were the probably the most magical geniuses of human history, really, to be able to even get anywhere near these exams. You were assigned a row based on the character of a story. And these are the characters of the story. And then you went down that row into your little cubicle right there. You were given three boards. You could make a little bed if you needed a nap. You could use it as a desk and a bench. And that was how you, you did your exam. So uh, HR makes that turn into that first pavilion. Uh, it's called Barrier of the Clouds Terrace. And so even in that, in the name, this is the Master of the Fishnet's names, Barrier, Barrier of the Clouds Terrace, right? So when you're stepping into the clouds, right, this first hall was sort of like understanding that this, there's a barrier to your scholarly success in that first hall. So, but the, the gentlemen are in there, and so that's, you, you, he's made the turn, and he's in this hall here, and there's a gathering of scholars. And he sees this first officials with the badges on, on their clothing. And these badges, uh, you know, we look at them, they're amazing pieces of art. Uh, what you don't, what you may not see right away is if they're birds, they're civil scholar officials. If they're animals, they're military. And uh, there was this incredible hierarchy of different birds, right? And so the what, what, what you sort of have to sort of understand with these with these badges is that the, the people in the know in society probably saw these badges like we understand car you know makes of cars. When you see somebody driving down the road in a Pinto versus a high-end Mercedes, right? You just know it. It's status. It's class. And so when you see a golden pheasant versus a pigeon. Uh, <laughs> So, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more. So, here, not pigeon, but crane or golden pheasant versus a quail or an oriole, okay? So, um, you know, we'll give them a little bit more credit than that. And then lion versus rhinoceros. Right? And the other way of reading these is that the emperor sat in the middle. The civil servants sat to the east of the emperor. The emperor um, sat facing uh, north to south. And the civil um, people sat to his, to his left, and so their badge looked back toward the emperor, but their wife has her bird matching her husband's looking back toward the husband. Same thing with the military. Most many of the military have the figures this way, but their head faces the emperor. You can see that line is turning this way. And then the wife uh, badge meets her husband's. And so that's basically the overall organization of the, of the scholar badge. So again, hierarchy in them. So HR has uh, been listening to these men and they're pontificating and, um, and he knows he's a little bit out of his league and so he sort of drops his head a little bit and starts walking out of the pavilion and he notices the column bases in the, in the halls. And he starts looking at them and they, they started and a very, very simple, small column base. So here's the column base at the ticket booth and the, and the uh, uh, gift shop. This is one of my favorites. If you, there's every one of these column bases changes slightly, and uh, you can see there's a little bit of a granite base that this sits on in the, in the Juan room. Um, all, of, all of this granite, if you don't know, in this lot in Lansu, all of the granite was hand chiseled, chiseled, and so there's a little chisel texture in it. And when the garden first opened, they were very distinct, and it was said that the the, the craftsmen could tell individual craftsmen's chiseling techniques and patterns. Um, so some of them are still good, and after 20 years, but in high traffic areas, they're starting to wear a little bit. But anyway. Um, so we get a uh, half middle circle in green. You can see a little bit, a little more vertical, but a similar, uh, but slightly different um, position. And knowing the fish, they're buried in the corners there, but yet you still want you to see it a little bit. Uh, uh, painted boat, you can see just a smidge uh, different, but um, a little bit more engaged. Um, uh, 
flowers wash in spring rain, uh, a little bit more of the plants on it. Then, um, Moonlight and Pavilion, a completely unique one. Uh, it's squashed, it has a little ring on it, uh, completely different, unique to the garden. Uh, the tea house, a uh, similar flower pot shape, but a little bit taller and bigger. Um, then you get to uh, the Scholar's Study, and you can see, it's a whole other little bit proportion in itself. And then when you get to the Hall of Brocated Clouds, it completely goes uh, on its own. We have a, this is the only hall that has the lotus base column, and then the, the outer columns are uh, multiple shapes. See how the has a uh, you have a, the plant, then you have a base on the pot, and then a whole other rib proportion system again. So you can see the column bases are really very very uh, distinct in terms of how it goes up in complexity and status. So so far we're, we're we've got three rows done. Um, I'm going to skip the non panel. Just um, this, the non paneling. Uh, there's not a lot of variations. Uh, some of them have been, been messed up a little bit uh, in some of our maintenance, and only the last two at Scholars Hall and uh, Hall of Brocade Clouds are really worth working at. Um, the window screens. So HR moves from um, the barrier of Klaus Terrace, and he goes into the next one on his own. He needs a little break. And this one's sort of interestingly called um, um, inside the, the tassel wash pavilion. So you're near the you're near the water. You're you know maybe washing off your your uh, you're cleansing things from your from your cloak or whatever. And he's looking out through these windows. This is master of the fishnets, and he's noticing uh, a gathering in this next pavilion across the lake. And then all of a sudden, uh, a very high-ranking uh, servant comes to greet him in this hall. And he is coming to, to bring uh, a special invitation for HR to come visit Ms. Mr. Chen up in his study up here. So he said, He'll, uh, I'll take you there. And this high-ranking uh, servant, uh, again, it, this is completely outside of our realm, but um, Lisa C. in her book, the, um, Heaney and Love talks about these high-ranking uh, uh, official gardens had 940 fingers in them. All right, and so when you look at 940 fingers, what does that mean? Well, in, in, the, in the garden of her of her story, there were 21 21 or 20, 210 fingers or 21 blood relatives living in this garden. There is 330 concubines, 330 fingers, 33 concubines. Wives, uh, not wives, concubines and daughters living within in in that garden, and 40 servants, uh, and so that's that's the 400. So uh, this servant was the highest ranking servant of the 40, essentially in this hall, coming to to greet HR to invite him, and so so here is the first hall. Here's here's uh, Tassel Wash Hall. And similar to our garden in Lansu, there's this elevated uh, crooked path here with a, with a very uh, famous pavilion that's very similar to our uh, uh, Moonlock pavilion. And so the servant leads HR along this pathway, but um, they re he real um, HR realizes that there's another gathering here. And looking through the lead windows, similar to our lead windows in Lansu, and there's another gathering going on in um, in that viewing porch, looking at the pines. And there's a basically a, a yaji, a group of, of uh, scholars working on paintings there. And so here is the plan of Master Fishnets. He entered here, and you can see here's the the Qing Dynasty axis way. He came in through here, here, here. Uh, the tassel wash. He got the invitation. He's being led along this path. But there's this group of scholars working here. So he noticed he wasn't led in front of them. He looks through these lead windows here into this beautiful western garden here, and then back around, and then we're going to head for the staircase there. Um, but uh, he stops for a minute and start and, and watching the, the men painting, uh, and um, in, in that looking at the pines and. 
noticing those views through the uh, windows screens and lattice windows. So looking forward into Lansu's windows and screens. Um, we have the windows in the, in the gift shop. Um, the Zhuang room has the first of um, the um, frame window, uh, which is a three-part window system that also happens again in the Scholarly study. But then you have half window circling green, which basically is a wonderful window on itself, looking at its alternate world down that piece of the, of the, of the river. Uh, knowing the fish has very uh, uh, distinct frame views. This is obviously not a window, but it's a frame view. And for those of you who know me, this is my uh, pet pea ginkgo tree. Uh, that ginkgo, uh, when, the, when the garden was first started, was considered a pygmy ginkgo, and it was a low umbrella ginkgo that was down here like this, <laughs> over by that was over by the you know, the only Taihu rock in Lansu, uh, which is horizontal, so the alligator mouth one on the north wall, on the way to knowing the fish. Uh, this ginkgo was initially planted, and it was this beautiful little umbrella pygmy ginkgo down there, and then it was transplanted here, and then it got away from them, and uh, it's now a lollipop. Ginkgo, and I, I was, you know, I tended to not make many comments, but this is one of the most important frame views in the whole garden, with the with the rose and the pine framing the view of the of the frozen rocks. And this ginkgo grew up right in its path, and then they lollipopped it there. And so that's that's my one my one criticism that I'll throw out there. Um, so that, that ginkgo just drives me crazy, knowing where it was 20 years ago. <coughs> Uh, so again, windows, and this is where no, uh, painted boat really flies. You have the, the three ginkgo screens I'm talking about. It bounces you through in, in a water over rocks. I, I've always considered these windows when you walk into a museum a gallery when there's too many paintings on the wall, and you know you, you're totally saturated. You can't see anything more, and you walk into this gallery, and there's just so many paintings. But as you're moving through it, all of a sudden you just notice one, and you stop for a second. And you look at this one painting. So this knowing the fish is built that way, and that uh, it's not a painted boat is built this way, and that uh, you're bouncing through here, and you might notice the frame view through one, maybe one or two of these little windows as you're going through. Uh, it's, it's a very very important aspect of that pavilion. So you have uh, uh, windows, uh, flowers washing spring rain. Obviously the frame views of the lake, the moon locking obviously in itself. The tea house has wonderful uh, expanded non-panel windows. Uh, these are the non-panels that I've skipped. Um, and then you get into the non-lattice windows of the scholar study. You can see it's this, um, it's a basically a rotated lattice pattern. And then the four-sided hall or hall of rotated clouds. And you have this very, very, you know, High, high status, glass on four sides, incredible status windows all the way around and all four sides, including these transoms up here. Uh, everything about that hall um, is quite amazing that way. So, HR is led past the scholars. Uh, that lattice, those lattice windows that sort of, you know, are sort of peaking his attention through here, around and up to this little staircase, and he's being led to the second floor up here. Um, and so, so here's the viewing porch for looking at pines and studying paintings, right? This, this hall here is called the Five Summits Reading Hut. And Five Summit Reading Hut is important to understand and master the fishnets compared to Lan Su's garden, Scholar's Hall, that's called the Celestial Hall of Permeating Fragrance. Um, you'll notice where our, our hall is called the Celestial Hall. The celestial hall, the word celestial, and this is um, right from uh, Charles Brew's book, uh, uh, Listen to the Fragrance, which is super important, but here's the name of the hall, right? Celestial Hall of Permanent Fragrance. The term celestial is very important. The term celestial is made up of two characters. That little T shape is the symbol for man, and that's the symbol for mountain. And so man on a mountain, is as close to heaven as you can get. Celestial. Okay, so our hall is called the Celestial Hall. When you're in this hall, you're as close to heaven as you can be. 
right? Um, and so this is my favorite uh, painting of that concept, right? Man on a mountain, you're as close to heaven, you're the celestial hall. Whereas the, the master and master of the fishnets uh, named his hut, the, his library, the hut of five mountains. So master suite, secluded embodiment, of ultimate self, that's my little poetry there. Um, and so, uh, even in the name, it's fascinating. But yes, he's being humble, calling this a hut, but it's the hut of five mountains. The five mountains are the major five mountain pilgrimages uh, uh, throughout China that becomes like the highest ranking uh, journeys that you can do. There's an emperor that would make, make sure that he got to all uh, four mountain ranges during his, during his ruler here. Um, and so, the Chinese phrase for pilgrimage means paying one respect to a mountain, seeing rocks in the garden is an invitation to make a mental journey to these sacred mountains. So, even in his humbleness of calling it a hut, he is associating it with the journey of the five mountains. If you can't physically get to the five mountains, the next best thing is to read poetry and look at paintings about these kind of journeys. Right? And so that's why a library then would be named that way. And so, not only are the window screens, but then you have the ginkgo screens. Um, and then so the ginkgo screens, these, uh, as he's making that little corner at the top of the stairs, and he's coming through these ginkgo screens, uh, the craftsmanship, and, and this is our ginkgo screen from the scholar's study, is very impressive and blowing you away. Um, and he makes the turn uh, with, with the servant into, into the library, and he sees this image and he's taken aback because there's the, and I don't know for sure if this is, uh, if this is actually um, Jia Jing, the emperor that sentenced him to death, but here's an emperor painting. Uh, but then he realizes that it's really Mr. Chen. Um, but uh, you start getting, the, you're starting to get the, the, the uh, this experience as he's walking into the hall. And the ginkgo screens um, start with, again, a ticket booth in them. There's one room we have. This is, this is one of the more interesting puns. Again, all of these status things inform the designers. What are the decisions the designers made when they decided to do this kind of screen or this kind of window or this kind of column? So when you're in the Zhuan room, which is one of the least status halls, it's like the, uh, like think of the Zhuan room as the man cave. You know, the man cave in our society is usually in the basement, right? Um, and ha even half window circle, I mean, sorry, the Zhuan room is called Reflections and Clear Ripples. It's talking about sitting down at a table, playing backgammon, looking through the screens of the railing at the reflections and clear ripples of the water. Um, but the ginkgo screen is only this little piece right here, right? And they, so they wanted to expand it in the transom, essentially. And this is, I think, from what I was told, is maple. It's the only place that the only place that a maple transom occurs is that, and there's glass in here uh, on that dividing line at that furrow line, right? So we're talking about spaces. You're in the primary space here, and then this is that secondary space, like in the diagram, right? So, um, I'm sorry, not too fast there. So, knowing the fish, I'm sorry, keep on doing that. Um, the painted boat, as I mentioned, has very, very uh, important ginkgo screens. So this is the triple ginkgo screen, this is the double ginkgo screen, and then there's the single back there. Again, I've measured it out, it's the same width, just divided into one, two, and three pieces, um, based on these layers. Um, the multiple panels here are, you know, are carved into, um, see, sorry, wrong arrow. Obviously, uh, the uh, flowers wash in spring rain has these very, very important uh, six panels of ginkgo screen uh, with the uh, illustrations here and the poems on the back. Um, skip over the, ne the next two pavilions, but then the celestial hall permeating fragrance has this wonderful ginkgo screen. Uh, that's in the three parts of the, of the uh, frame window. And one of my favorite parts of the ginkgo screen in the scholar study are the exposed uh, pegs. And all of this screen is all hand-pegged. 
And you know, if you want to really sort of get into the craftsmanship of that screen, uh, sort of in an almost more of a modern architectural kind of way, you know, you can see it because you can see the miters and the pegs and how this whole thing is pieced together. Um, but then when you get into hollow brocaded clouds, they step up even more where it's, it's the three friends of winter, which is plum, uh, you know, plum bamboo and pine. And it's in all three bays of the hollow brocaded clouds. Again, this is a different way of dividing up that second space. Um, so you have a seating area, uh, almost like an entrance hall and a seating area in, in that same column spacing. But notice that the joinery is hidden in this in this screen. So it even ups the, the craftsmanship level. So we're making progress through here. So um, so HR is sitting there in front of Master Chen uh, and he's painting. And he doesn't really, he's not, he just sits there quietly, and Mr. Chen finally looks up. And the first thing he says to him is, if you were required, how would you divide this painting amongst my brothers? And HR is like sitting there thinking, now, you know, where is this going? Right? And so Mr. Chen just sort of waits a little bit and for the answer. And he says, uh, you know, I, I, have, I have some money. I'm getting older. Uh, and I want to invest in my family. Um, and if I have money left over when I die, then the brothers fight. Uh, that painting could be cut into pieces, but if I invest in, a, in another hall for my garden, that's going to be very, very hard to dismantle, and the family will have to live together and stay together with this hallway, right? So if building a scholar hall or expanding the garden or investing in the rocks of the garden, rocks are another issue that can be taken apart, but um, investing in these, in these halls became an investment in the family's future. So Master Chen asks, you know, so how, how I, I want to build a high status hall. And going back to the Bon, the construction of this house, this magnificent hall, depends entirely on the clever planning of the craftsman, wealth, and rampant result proper measurements, but yin and yang must be taken into consideration too. So this is what I was talking about. When you have a seven column hall, here's the primary hall, that is that secondary zone that I was talking about where the day bed is and the seating area and all the brocaded clouds. And you can do different things with it. Our typical thing in, um, in the typical thing is that this becomes a circulation hall outside and you enter in the primary hall and then that's where the, uh, the day bed is in scholar studies essentially. But you can do it different things. You can make it all one space. You can have two circulation zones. There's lots of things you can do with the seven column hall. Um, and so, so here we go. So the second interior space, ease and circulation. So taking that further, here is all of Lansu diagrams with my system of um, circulation. So get you oriented here. And uh, let's see. I'm even getting this far around. Here we go. Here's the entrance. Here's the entrance gate. Here's the ticket booth. Here's knowing the fish, right? So you can sort of see here's circulation all the way around the hall, brocaded clouds. And then the, the primary space and the secondary space is back in there. Here's the tea house. Here's the scholar study. There's the secondary space, right? There's the master's. There's the, the, uh, the actual scholar study that's adjacent to the primary hall and his secondary space. The red is the circulation, et cetera. So that's my system of looking at those, at those spaces. Um, and so the status of the seven column hall section. Uh, this one is a little bit too elaborate, so let me go to this. So this was my model, and I had an amazing draftsman that worked with me starting at, uh, out of high school uh, 10 years ago. And he was working with me when I first did this lecture in 2008, and he did these uh, sketch-up studies with me. So again, the columns or purlins, so here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven column hall. And there you get a little bit better sense of the space in there. 
But again, this way, I call it your primary hall, there's your secondary space, maybe circulation or hallway, or you can combine it all together. Lots of things you can do in, within there. And so, um, Master Chen said, yeah, I want to build you know, a high status hall. Um, and uh, HR is sort of, uh, what should I say, he's uh, honored that uh, Master Chen is talking to him about that. Um, they're talking about techniques. And so you know, you're thinking about putting together a hall and, and making it, this is my favorite example of what Chinese architecture based, been brought down to its simplest form. The most important piece right here is the Lu 2, which is like our one of you. For those of you who work with Lincoln Blocks as a kid, the little mini one that just crisscrosses right here, right? That's this right there. And there's your Lu 2. Um, and so then you have the Lu 2 and the Haogang, and, uh, and basically everything is just based on those stacking back and forth. So here, again, Lu 2. Here's the Aang. One of my favorite aspects of, of this uh, diagram is that all of this stuff is basically like, like a teeter-totter. Um, and so these rafters here going back are being held by this bracket system that brings the load back down here, right? When you, when you had small pieces of rafters and um, you wanted to hold them up and, and create a, a bigger span here, right? These rafters needed to be pushed upwards. And so without having a column underneath here, you can do a little teeter-totter. Imagine putting a big kid down here, and a little kid here is being pushed up. And so what they did is, to help hold up this long rafter, is they did a teeter-totter with all the weight on the eaves pushing down and pushing up there. So this is actually pushing upward in, in that piece of section. So it's uh, really a, a wonderful thing, but basically, again, it's all of this complexity is basically brought down to that into piece. Right? There's our favorite little four pieces there. Right? So getting into the primary trusses of, of um, Lansu. Uh, gift shop, and even the gift shop um, basically follows exactly the five column hall. One, two, three, four, five. Boom. So it's a merchant space. They built it as a five column hall. Um, Juan room is the classic seventh. Uh, there's the outside one, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then the frozen window, uh, free frame window seven out there. So one of the things when you're looking at that, uh, when, when you're looking at these halls, um, and this is a classic case, is start looking at the complexity of the connection of the purlin to the column, um, and the complexity of the column start. This is I call this a squash column. Imagine this column being built out of clay, and they put the load of the roof here, and it squishes because it's heavy, squishes it down. You notice it's a little bit tapered, and it's sort of squished down, and it actually sort of wraps down over. It's being pushed down over that beam. So, um, so again, this is the simplest of Lonsu's. Um, half window circled in green. Uh, there's some complexity and variation. This is the first time that the center ridge it gets expanded. I still count this in, uh, expansion of the center ridge into two as one. Um, they, they just use that as just, you know, to make it a little fancier. They'll, they'll separate that, the ridge into two pieces here. But again, it's basically still in the seven column hall counting. Um, knowing the fish is, um, it's hard to count seven in here, but you, you can get there. But one of the really fascinating things of knowing the fish is that this is a square and this is a rotated square. And it's really sort of fun the way they, they spin the, uh, the framing on that. So again, uh, painted boat, they do the same thing where that's the ridge, but they split it into two. And this space of painted boat is the is the basically the cargo hold of a barge. And so this this goes back to basically a five column. You have the outside bracket we'll talk about one, two, three, four, five. So even the merchant space and painted halls inform that way. 
circled in green. This is one of the really interesting ones. I, it, it almost, I don't re ever really remember looking up into, uh, into the, um, the moon landing pavilion. There's so much to look at, obviously, that you don't ever really you know, think about it. But when I was taking pictures for the, you know, putting this lecture together, I took a picture and you know, I looked up there and I was like, oh my god, they really cheated us on that one. Um, they just like, just they, they decided to completely hide it. You know, who knows what they were doing up there, uh, and, you know, to, to hide the framing, but they decided to do that. Uh, which is probably one of the, the, the most blatant cheats in the whole garden. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, and then you have uh, Tower, uh, sorry, Tower of Cosmic Reflections, uh, the tea house. Wild as heck, uh, totally taking the whole idea of seven columns and, and expanding it in all kinds of crazy ways. Again, there, there's the double ridge with this big, I call it an anvil rafter that's sitting on these big brackets that are holding this. But then they decided to drop the column here, right? Um, if you go into the tea house, you'll notice there's stress cracks in the, in the beams. Uh, and that's okay. Stress cracks, when, when the wood breaks into uh, stress cracks, it becomes multiple beams. Um, and so the reason why it's stressing is because when a beam goes like this, the top part is in compression and the bottom is in tension pulling. And there's a divide between the pushing, the crunching fibers and the pulling fibers, and that's what creates a crack, right? But if you think about it, if you take one piece of bamboo and you load it, it's going to droop, right? But if you take five bundles of bamboo and you wrap them together, it's even much stronger. And that's because you have five beams that are all bundled together now acting in one. And so these cracks that you see in the tea house are similar to that, but there's just so much loading going on in, in that roof that it's, it, they really uh, <laughs> went out on a, on a structural limb in terms of uh, playing with that structure. And then um, scholar study is the classic, but what you can see is these brackets start getting a little bit more ornate. Um, in, in the connection between column and purlin. Uh, and so they've expanded these connections a little bit more. And then uh, hollow brocaded clouds, there's the anvil uh, beam again, and you can see uh, they, they split the ridge, and then you have these multiple stack anvil column uh, beams rather than the straight uh, log beams. Uh, so again, the highest status of the primary framing of the primary column. And then secondary arches. I, I call it, you know, looking at the first cone. Uh, the first, the cone is this little bracket here, uh, here. So the first is how you expand it and how many times you expand that loading, right? And so what we're looking at is that this is the primary column and here's the primary hall. This secondary zone right here starts uh, operating in different ways. So you can cantilever it all out. Notice that it's all being cantilevered down to that column here, or you can create another. Uh, archway. And so you have the secondary brackets. So uh, here's the ticket booth. And there is the secondary bracket. It's all tucked in nice and tight in that five column hall. Um, the, here's the first of the Juan room. Here's the first of the simple secondary arches. Notice, this is uh, another key to look at. Notice this nice flat arch uh, rafter system in Juan room. And this simple little um, little beam and a simple uh, fifth purlin or seventh purlin. And it starts getting more complex as you go half in a circle in green. It's all based on that how many cones and, uh, and arms they have in here. Uh, and then knowing the fish, uh, they start, notice this little bracket here. So, you know, you, you, they've gone from this tight stack here to knowing the fish, the first of the brackets, see, and holding a whole nother rafter out here. And then you get to um, painted boat in this gray. This is outside uh, the main space here. Here you've got this column out here on this uh, special bracket there. Uh, 
flowers wash in spring rain. Again, they didn't. It's a little bit more elaborated graphic. And, um, and then uh, power of with reflections. You can see they start expressing the, the rafters further out. So here's that framing in Tower of Cosmic Reflections. And so you have one, two, three, four, five, six, and then there's an implied seventh out there with this rafter. You see they drop the columns off in that main T space. And uh, again, all kinds of interesting anvil um, uh, beams there. Scholar study. Uh, Celestial Hall, you can see, remember I talked about the, the very simple arch in, in the Shawan room uh, on the way to the bathroom there. Look at what they've done here with this arch. It's become a much more elaborate. They've created an, an anvil and bracket uh, beam rather than just a simple beam across here. They've expanded it with another bracket to carry that little rafter. Uh, all of that is considered the seventh purling right there. All of that. And then you get the hollow rotating clouds even more. They've, dug, they've tripled the, the anvil beam there, an even more elaborate horseshoe uh, uh, arch, and then they extended it even more with this bracket carrying those rafters. All of this is considered, I consider that the secondary arch. So, and uh, um, they keep playing with that. And so HR is thinking about, you know, they're talking, he's talking with Master Chen and he starts opening up a little bit more and he starts talking about his time in Beijing. And he starts talking about, you know, the nine column halls in the Forbidden City. So when we get to nine, so here's the seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Here's eight and here's nine. And so when you get to a nine column hall, there is all kinds of things you can do with it. You could have two hallways here and two separate rooms completely. Maybe the concubines live on either side of here, and then you have you keep them apart with a double corridor and a primary gathering hall here, right? So there's all kinds of things you can do with a nine-column hall. And again, 507 BC. Um, adherence to the true measures of our patron saint will bring forth wealth and rank and ample farmlands as well. The people of the, per of the present age do not obey the method of the immortal master. This harmony between the houses and its acronyms will be the result. So, uh, the five days there will be perpetual love for a thousand and ten thousand years. Right. So, a lot of a lot of things are at stake in in these nine column halls. So here is an overall view of the Forbidden City, and that is um, the, the highest status hall in the entire emperor, em empire. And so we're talking, this is a SketchUp model that I actually got online from somebody who spent a lot of time doing a SketchUp model, but it's really wonderful. Uh, and you can see how that threshold concept that I was talking about and, um, has been expanded. Again, the highest ranking building in the entire empire. All these multiple layers and steps to get up there. The major threshold to get up there, a huge threshold to step over. You have to bow to the emperor as you're stepping over that threshold. And we're, and we're talking about the Hall of Supreme Harmony, that hall right there. And when you look at the Hall of Supreme Harmony, how do you get this huge space of a Supreme Harmony? In, you know, how do you count nine? So here's, I, I gave you the nine numbers, but even that's a little hard to follow. So I did this one for you. <coughs> Okay, so here's column one, and then the bracketing. Here's column two, and the bracketing off of that. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Right. So, uh, and that's, again, the highest status hall in the entire world, and that is all one big space under those nine, nine purlins. So, uh, here's the status of the section, three, five, seven, nine. And going back to that diagram that I started you with, I had a professor named John McBrocken who was from Holland uh, in college in graduate school. And uh, he was really big into public housing in, in Holland in the 1960s. Um, and our entire semester was spent on creating 
a single section and how many variations you can do off of that section. And so this study that I'm done here is sort of based on that semester I did with John Brocken with the idea that you take a, a single section and all the variations you can do in terms of spaces within these simple columns. Um, and so, you, you know, following my system, here's the all one space, right? Or space and side space and circulation and secondary complete and secondary different rooms. You can have a bigger secondary room and a more private hall, right? And so you can see all of these variations just based on that one, one section and the richness you can get out of building nine columns, with nine columns. So, then uh, HR and, Chen and, and Master Chen are talking away, and then all of a sudden, uh, Master Chen you know, says, um, uh, so, So Master Chen asked about uh, if, whether HR knows uh, who is the master of the mountains in the district. And all of a sudden, uh, HR realizes that Master Chen got him talking a little bit uh, in, in a little more than a, non, a little more than a non-humble way. And he realizes he's being networked because what was going, what always has been going on throughout Chinese history. And this is a whole other specialty study, which is totally fascinating, was that land tenure and resources had, had always been part of the Chinese government and bureaucracy. There is very, it's called Yuhan. And it, it's a it was a little bit more, it's been documented back in time. Um, but when you get into, uh, as you see here, you know, Zhao and the Tang Dynasty, as you get further into the Qing, Song, and Ming dynasty, the government has gotten so expansive that there, there's all kinds of levels of people involved in resources, uh, and it's very hard to find any information. I've spent many, many, many hours trying to find more information about what and how, the, how you procure building materials in the Ming dynasty. In other words, when you're building a high status hall, you need good quality logs, right? You need to get these logs from somewhere. You needed to get permits or an, an, an acknowledgement from the master of forests and rivers and lakes to cut these logs to get them from somewhere, right? And so what I don't know, and maybe there's someone out here who does, but what was the networking and the, the social contract and who paid who to be allowed to, to cut the pine and the namu to, to actually create a high status hall. Uh, and so what's, what's fascinating is this Yunheng official in the early days was responsible for governing the mountains. And uh, in, in your clear description of the official post functions in the Qin dynasty, Qin dynasty, and he was still in charge of mountains, forests, rivers, and lakes. And you get down here and rivers, firewood, farmland, and hunting. And they had they had rules, ecological rules about not hunting and, or you know, cutting in, in the wrong times. Hunting is permitted within no hunting is permitted within 150 kilometers of the city centers. So there was there was rules out there, ecological rules and resource rules that uh, would be fascinating to, to dive into, um, especially later on when things became a little bit more scarce and population was increasing. Um, so HR looks out the window and he's realizing that he's getting a little bit of play here. Um, and um, he's looking again, he's in the second floor, he's looking down over the roofs of the garden. And this is one of the things that I'm, I'm actually uh, skipped over in, in the matrix for you because the, the, it's a very complex, very detailed discussion. And here, here's the, the, um, the hut of five mountains and he's looking down over all these overhangs and so forth. And again, it's very context-driven discussion. I can do it, but it's not, it's, it's difficult. But you're looking at ridges, and uh, Master Chen uh, asks, uh, 
um, HR, so how is your mentoring project going on? And HR, Haru Rui, was, became known in time because he formalized this mapping system and how you map and calculate the areas of land uh, in farmland so they can be taxed. And like, in a, like death and taxes, uh, it was a huge, huge thing, obviously, in, in the Chinese world. So when you had lots of property and they weren't exactly rectangular, how were they measured? So Hyrule Weed's true government uh, effort was formalizing these tax maps. Where are all of these characters, how the size of the page, how it was measured when you had a parallelogram in a field, how you calculated it. You calculated it by a rectangle and you chopped off those triangles, and that's how you calculated the area. Uh, you can measure that side and that side based on your rectangle. And so, uh, and he became known for adamantly pushing this uh, to create taxes and to be more fair because the, the, the wealthy property owners were all, oh, this is too complex, we never, we never can figure out exactly what our fields are and they weren't paying their fair share and just like in you know, our world today, right? The middle class, you get taxed and the wealthy figure out ways not to. In fact, uh, uh, main, main gardens were tax loopholes. When, if it was considered a garden, that land was not taxed, right? So capital gains, right? <laughs> uh, so nothing's changed. But so this is what Hanui is known for: is this uh, formalizing this tax code and collecting taxes and pushing the fairness of that tax. So uh, you know, Master Chen is asking, you know, so how how you how is this going? Uh, and then Hanui HR starts talking about it, and then Master Chen just basically says. Um, other brothers may not be so complimentary. And that was all, you know, he sort of just left that, that conversation. HR sort of like takes a little breath back knowing that he's starting to get pushed a little bit here uh, and looks out the window and he, and he looks at the ridges. So, again, Lansu's ridges, this is sort of an interesting exception. Um, this hall gets a little bit more uh, fancy tying into the entrance. Um, but you have a simple ridge of the, of the Zhuang. These gable ends in the language of ridges and eaves start adding to the status of that, and those are in those very fine, fine points of ridge design uh, to the point where that becomes <coughs> then capped. Um, and so here is um, a painted boat. You got the double gable e bridge being expanded. Uh, this, there's, this whole thing becomes this gable cap, so I'll call that the expansion of the status there. Uh, again, the four-sided, that's the, the structure that's being hidden from, from that other slide, all up in there is all being hidden. Um, uh, again, a simple ridge, but very expanded with this uh, gable ridge uh, combination. Then you get these two, um, these were just rebuilt, you know, very, they did a really excellent job of, um, did he do, a, um, the guy that did the roof re repair, did he do a lecture for you guys a, few, a year ago or so? Maybe not. He did it at the garden. Yeah, at the garden, okay. But one of the, one of the wonderful things about the Scholar Study Ridge is they expand it with this three-dimensional perforated ornament, but these are stacked tiles that are, are stacked one inside the other, right? But then, you, so you take this idea where you have this tile repeated there, so you're, it's a really wonderful repeat. You create an ornament out of the same material, but you're, all you're doing is getting the, the edge. And then you get to the hollow brocaded clouds, and you have the whole, full expanded ridge, obviously the dragonfish, um, and you take these roof tiles and basically you take this U and you go like this or like this and that's what creates this pattern, right? That's a roof tile down and then up, right? And, and then on the side. And so you're, you're getting a repetition of shape that create that expanded ridge, expanded detail and so forth. So believe it or not, we've now gotten through 100. 
right? The, 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 ten, the ten halls, the ten rows, um, and with a few exceptions, and as I said, I, I, I jumped you on the eve and I jumped you on the nine panel, but other than that, we've gone through the hundred. So, HR thinks back to his time in uh, Beijing, um, and he knows you know, he's gotten a bit played here, and he thinks back to the highest status ridge in, in the entire, uh, entire dynasty. And this, this, again, this is on that Hall of Supreme Harmony. You have these nine guardian an uh, animals. There's a debate about whether this is a person hung for greed or uh, a scholar riding at Wee Lin, which is a, a combination lion bird. You have the, a guard with a, a cane or a sword guarding, guarding the, the nine uh, dynam dynamic animals, and then here is the emperor overlooking everything. Uh, again, that is the highest status ridge in the entire empire. Um, and so you think of that compared to our, our, our bridge um, that Paul broke in clouds, right? Uh, all of a sudden, Master Chen goes quiet and, and he's looking back down at his painting and, and HR realizes the conversation is probably over. And uh, so as I say, the threat was, has been received. Uh, and so, the servant gives him a little nod see, uh, outside that ginkgo screen, and HR gets up and walks around the corner. He's standing there in the corner of the, right there on that balcony I showed you. He's looking down over the eaves, and here's Lan Su, and uh, as part of the high status of the hollow brocaded clouds, uh, no, here's the, um, we have the three plenties plus one. It's the only roof in Lan Su that has the four flower pots there, and on the side facing the, the the Tranquility Courtyard, the Entrance Courtyard, you have um, the, um, the pomegranate and the peach. The pomegranate represents abundance of many offspring. Um, the peach is a longevity peach. When you eat it, you live 10,000 years. When you have a birthday cake, uh, when you're 65 years old, you have a birthday. Uh, uh, the, 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 the bun that you had is in the shape of a peach. Um, there's all, like all good things and all of Chinese symbolism, there's multiple meanings because it's very wholesome, right? What could be more wholesome than abundance of many offspring and longevity and, uh, you know, uh, in life? But wink, wink, nod, nod, those are also fertility symbols that are carved into the bedposts of the concubines, yeah. right? So there's like, you know, when you, when you have buddies over for a scholar, scholar gathering, there's always multiple meanings in that. So then the, the three plenty is plus one over here when you're at the, in the lake. There's the, the, the plus one is the plum. That, that flower pot right here is the plum, is the five happinesses. Um, but then you get this last uh, pot here, which is uh, a whole loaded uh, treasure trove in itself. And so HR knows that he's in trouble again. Uh, and. Uh, in, again in 1570, and he thinks back to the Chen brothers who lived here in 1032 and 1033. Chen Hao was kind-hearted, conciliatory, mild like the sun in spring, but his younger brother was cold and harsh like the hoarfrost in autumn. And these two brothers wrote Confucian uh, manuscripts, and they were very, very famous. And, um, and Chen Ying, uh, most famous thing is uh, the principle of one thing is one with the principle of all. So if you really understand the basic principle of it, of one, you're going to be you won't be so far off. And knowledge forms the basis for self cultivation and conduct, and that's what high we, we, we live by. And to attain knowledge, one must apprehend the principle of things. To apprehend the principle of things, you must investigate them. And then when investigation has been practiced over a long period of time, does it become possible to reach a free comprehension and knowledge of sincerity? And that quote, our emotional and moral life is in balance. So that centers HR. He knows that things are going to be tough again, but, you know, uh, but, you know, if I stick to with his principles, uh, he's going to be okay. And so and he looks out there and sees the Buddhist hand, and uh, Buddha's hand 
you have the protection of the Buddha uh, in Buddhist hand, which like two hands. But um, one of the most important things of Buddhist hand is it represents the idea that the true value of knowledge is is when you make knowledge your own. And um, that that's how I'll finish up. <laughs> Q&A, and so you know, we'll take questions uh, orderly, so you can kind of raise your hand, we'll recognize you. We'll start right off here. Here's the mic. Thank you. I'm sorry if I missed this, but um, do the old Chinese houses with a high threshold, does that threshold have a purpose, a practical value, or uh, um, There is a... There's a sort of a fun uh, email thing that's going around uh, for years and years and years. You know, the, the origins of the term threshold. Uh, and so what that claims is the origin of the term threshold is back in the days when you had mud floors and you used fresh hay, straw, hmm. to, uh, to, to compact it down to insulate your floors and create a floor that you lived in so you're not on the mud. And so that threshold is holding the depth of your thresh at the doorway, right? And so supposedly that is the origin of the term threshold. It makes sense, but I, you know, it's one of those, you know, you know, is it, is it a myth or not? But that's the, that's the point. more years, the, the honesty and integrity catches up to him again. He's hired to go back to Nanjing as an old man and start again and as, an, as uh, an official censor. And he dies in Nanjing in the, about 80 years old or something like that. But, uh, so anyway, that's kind of uh, how Rui's life, um, a little bit more expanded. But. Any more questions? I have one more minute. Fascinating is when you build in America, 
And this is what you know, Frank Lloyd Wright tried to do, was he tried to create a new language. When you build here in America, we, we are a melting pot. We don't have a real culture to build to. As an architect, how do you build to someone's culture? The, the, what was going on here and what this lecture talks about is 5,000 years of common culture, symbol, and, and attitudes. And when and this architecture was developed on a 5,000 year single language understanding, right? And so this architecture has a 5,000 year history. When you're talking about building in America, what are you building? What are people's aspirations? What are people's symbols? Um, and so Frank Lloyd Wright tried to create a new thing and he was talented enough to be able to develop start one. But again, we're so fractured, there's nothing really uh, that you can really read other than size um, in our society uh, in terms of this status. And, and it's, you know, obviously in my jaded architectural world, it's gotten worse and worse and worse. <laughs> okay, first of here. Okay, I don't know. Is this know. a high official? Yes. Or? Yes. So the person who would have been able to afford the, the beginnings of the Master of the Fish Dam would have been a very high-ranking official. Uh, the most famous one in, in Suzhou is the uh, Garden of the Humble Administrator, yeah. and he, that's the most famous. It's the largest of Suzhou. That the name of that comes from someone who is so high-ranking that he worked in Beijing, but then Suzhou was known for. Uh, these high-ranking Beijing officials retiring to Suzhou. And it was these very, very, Suzhou was at the very north end with Hangzhou, which was the, it, which was the silk road, the silk area where the mulberry trees grew, and, the, and Hangzhou is, is still famous for its silk. And Suzhou as well, the silk, the silk institute is in Suzhou, right? So there was wealth there with the silk industry, but it also had the climate, um, uh, that was more beneficial than living in Beijing. And so these government officials all retired, and it was a critical mess. Uh, you know, it was, you know, people of high, uh, common status, common intellect, again, these were the most brilliant people in man's history, right? And so you, you hang together, you party together, you, you know, you, you converse together. And that was still true in Qing. Yes. There's a question right here. Well, I'm going to shout it out, okay? Uh, is there, <laughs> these principles you described, is modern Chinese architecture using any of those in any, any way, is there any effort made to carry through these traditions? Or are they branching out too far, too far from them? Uh, you, if you're a Feng Shui master, you know, I, know, I noticed I didn't bring any Feng Shui, and uh, a little bit with the, with the catching of the, the axle, the spirit coming down through the axis. Uh, feng Shui, um, you're familiar with, is, 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 how, is the, again, a 5,000 year system of how you build to create luck and auspicious things. Um, and so a Feng Shui master in modern day China can be, can be paid thousands of dollars an hour for their consultations. So, uh, and sometimes when things like a high rise building has gone wrong, um, they will bring in feng shui consultants even in today's world, and it's like, what's, you know, why, why are this business failing, and you know, this high rise versus another high rise, and so they're still using it. Uh, in the obviously in the structural systems, not so much. Um, people are starting to look backwards a little bit more, um, but obviously, you know, you're also talking about techniques and, and a whole different level of investment. But the feng, shui, the feng Shui stuff is being recognized. Um, one of the more interesting ones uh, that uh, was one of the great failures in modern architecture is in London, in, in the walk, what they call a walkie-talkie building. If you're, if you're familiar with that, is it's a high-rise in London. I forget the architect. Right? But you know, things you can do anything in today's world structurally, so that the high-rise bends like this, right? And uh, and what they didn't realize is when the sun hits, it's just like a, almost like a uh, um, uh, solar collector mirror, and it's literally 
burning cars on the street. Uh, because the, the sun is hitting this con convex, uh, concave thing, and literally firing down like a laser beam, and it's literally burned up cars on the street. And this is a you know classic feng shui screw up in terms of you know not thinking about what's your south facing thing doing. And what it, the the feng shui term is throwing poison darts. Uh, you don't want a, a gable or a ridge pointing at your house and others, right? And so like if your neighbor has a gable uh, and ridge pointing at you, you want to do certain things like wind chimes and other things to help protect that energy coming at you, being thrown at poison darts thrown at you. So that stuff, that's a whole other question. Okay, next question, right over here. Question is, the next year, Stepping on the authority or the power in any way of the emperor. 
right? But by the time the Qing Dynasty gets around, this whole idea of, of axial development and, and, and geometric shrubberies and things like that start creeping in. The, the important thing about Chinese architecture was that they really didn't have architects. This book here, Chinese Architecture, um, is a compilation of a husband-wife architectural team that came to study at the University of Pennsylvania and Harvard in the 1920s and 30s. They were one of the very first quote-unquote architects in China. And they went back to China, fortunately, in the 1930s, uh, because they, they knew that ancient architecture was starting to get disappeared. And they started you know, doing a lot of measured drawings, they started developing things, and they're the ones that sort of dug up a lot of the old texts. But you know, when you're reading Chinese, you can't sound things out, right? Uh, a character is a word, and when you're reading a text from the four, uh, from I think the, they, they talk about um, the, there was a, a, a bunch of craftsman notes about how you build. They no longer knew what those characters meant. The terms had disappeared, and so uh, you know when things were being labeled with a character, nobody was around to tell them what that was any longer. So they had to rebuild the language from those craftsman notes of the, I think it was 1200 or 1400 or something like that. But this is a fantastic book um, in terms of that. Uh, and they went throughout China and they measured and photographed a lot of the old ancient buildings uh, just prior to World War II. And then obviously between the Japanese bombings and then the Civil War, uh, just this, be, this becomes one of the best information on, on that, all the old architecture. So this is my uh, pictorial bibliography uh, for you. You probably recognize most of these. Um, and um, this one, if you're into Confucian, this one is a great book, Confucian Rule. If you're interested in, uh, in Ming Dynasty Gardens, in our garden, Lansu, Fruitful Sites is probably the densest. Basically, it reads like a PhD thesis that was published. Um, and so it's, but if you're looking at how Ming Dynasty architecture is tied to Ming society, uh, this is the end all of, of, of all that I've, I've seen. Uh, fruitful Sites is, is absolutely amazing. So, anyway. Um,